This is Audible. Audible Incorporated presents Where Are the Customers' Yachts? or A Good Hard Look at Wall Street. Written by Fred Schwed Jr. Narrated by Mark Mosley. Introduction Late one evening in January 2000, I left my office at 50th Street and 6th Avenue in Manhattan and got into a taxi. The driver pulled forward and we waited for the traffic light to change. Moments later, four young men in matching power ties and power suits came striding powerfully right into the street. One of them rapped on the driver's window. The cabbie opened it a few inches and the whiz kid barked, We're going to 49th and Park! Just four blocks and a few minutes' walk across town. I already have a fare, answered the taxi driver, hooking his thumb toward me in the back seat. Throw him out, said the hotshot, and we'll give you a hundred bucks. He wasn't kidding. Reaching in through the window, he shoved a one hundred dollar bill in the taxi driver's face. I can't do that, protested the cabbie, pushing the money away. The light changed, my cabbie shut the window, and we sped away from the scene like two maidens escaping the tent of Attila the Hun. This bizarre hijacking attempt haunted me for days. It reminded me of something else about bull markets, money, and traveling around Manhattan, but I could not put my finger on what it was. And then about a week later, the words, Where are the customers' yachts? popped into my head and I quickly found this passage in Fred Schwed Jr.'s text. In 1929, there was a luxurious club car which ran each weekday morning into the Pennsylvania station. Near the door, there was placed a silver bowl with a quantity of nickels in it. Those who needed a nickel in change for the subway ride downtown took one. They were not expected to put anything back in exchange— this was not money, it was one of those minor conveniences, like a quill toothpick for which nothing is charged. It was only five cents. There have been many explanations of the sudden debacle of October 1929. The explanation I prefer is that the eye of Jehovah, a wrathful God, happened to chance in October upon that bowl. In sudden, understandable annoyance, Jehovah kicked over the financial structure of the United States and thus saw to it that the bowl of free nickels disappeared forever. The moment I reread Schwed's passage, it hit me. Once again, a bull market had roared so far up so fast that money had decayed into a minor convenience. Young men would now rather fork over a hundred dollars and shaft a stranger than go to the bother of walking four city blocks. Schwed's words instantly turned my hot anger over what had happened to me into a bone-chilling premonition of what was about to happen to the stock market. Jehovah, I realized, was going to yank the one hundred dollar bills away any day now. And I was right, or rather, Schwed was right. Less than six weeks later, the Nasdaq index began crashing, and it went on to lose three-quarters of its value over the next two and a half years. So much for waving $100 bills around as if they were scraps of used Kleenex. The prophetic power of Schwed's anecdote about the bowl of nickels is no coincidence. As you will learn again and again as you listen to his little masterpiece, Fred Schwed shares the basic attributes of all great American humorists, from Mark Twain and H. L. Mencken to Tom Lehrer, George Carlin, and Chris Rock. A passion for ideas a keen sense of justice, and outrage that the world is the way it is instead of the way it should be. Schwed is almost always too much of a gentleman to let his anger show, but his compassion is constant, and his warnings echo down the decades. The names and faces and machinery of Wall Street have changed completely from Schwed's day, but the game remains the same. The individual investor is still situated at the very bottom of the food chain, a speck of plankton afloat in a sea of predators. In fact, Wall Street has changed so little that Schwed's mockery with the passage of time has become indistinguishable from prophecy. 
the mutual fund scandals of 2003, in which fund managers were revealed to be breaking their own trading rules in the pursuit of even fatter fees, were foreshadowed in Schwed's unforgettable description of professional investors. At the close of the day's business, they take all the money and throw it up into the air. Everything that sticks to the ceiling belongs to the clients. Schwed's words are an enduring warning to watch your fund managers like a hawk, not to take them for granted, as so many investors did until the latest round of scandal. The people who took corporate financial reports on faith and never questioned the accounting principles of major companies like Enron or WorldCom would have known better if they had remembered Schwed's rule. Accounting is not even an art, but just a state of mind. His words are another reminder that if you are not a skeptic, you are not an investor. Nor are you an investor if you obsess about the price of a stock, but know nothing about the value of the business it represents. In the late 1990s, many traders did no research on companies, learning nothing but the ticker symbols of whichever stocks, CMGI, DCLK, WBVN, were going up. Who ran the company? What did it make? Was its business profitable? Who cared, so long as the stock kept rising? In Schwed's time, too, traders ignored the business and obsessed over the stock, learning only the ticker symbol. They ended up getting wiped out, as a new generation would decades later. Finally, there is Schwed's classic twin definition. Speculation is an effort, probably unsuccessful, to turn a little money into a lot. Investing is an effort, which should be successful, to prevent a lot of money from becoming a little. Today, as in Schwed's time, people who try to get rich quick still insist on calling themselves investors, even though they are clearly speculators. Today's computer technology and online trading have done nothing to improve the odds against their success, which Swed estimates, pretty realistically in my opinion, at 25 to 1. Add it all up, and you can learn as much from Schwed about the follies and pitfalls of investing as you can from far more serious and detailed guides. After all, learning how to invest your money more wisely is rarely much fun. Sometimes listening to an audiobook about investing can make you think. Occasionally you can learn something useful. But almost never does an audiobook about investing make you laugh. Schweds is the only financial audiobook out of the hundreds I've listened to that will provoke you, teach you, and crack you up all at once. I've read Where Are the Customer's Yachts more times than I could possibly count. And, like an obsessed fan chanting along with a Monty Python skit, I still laugh at the same wonderful old lines. Schwed's observations are not only funny, they cut straight to the heart of permanent truths about money and human nature. In short, nothing else you can listen to about investing is likely to be as much fun as the audiobook you are about to begin. Enjoy and learn. Jason Zweig, Money Magazine, September 2005 Forward to the 1995 edition I like to think that when I first stumbled across this delightful little book, the ghost of its author stumbled right along with me, with a gin and tonic in his hand. I'd been leafing idly through the Princeton University Library collection and had pretty well concluded that there was nothing written about Wall Street in the 1920s of use to someone hoping to create an audiobook about Wall Street in the 1980s. But as I replaced the final dusty volume on the shelf, I noticed beside it another, more luridly titled, more tastefully bound. And once I picked it up, I did not put it down until I had finished. Long before Burton Malkiel wrote A Random Walk Down Wall Street, Fred Schwed Jr. actually took one. He went to work on Wall Street in the early 1920s after being ejected from Princeton at the end of his senior year for having a girl in his room at six o'clock in the evening. He stayed only a couple of years and wrote only this one book about the experience but it is a gem. It was a funny book about Wall Street that is still a funny book about Wall Street. 
it continues to amuse us while so much of the other humorous writing of the period now seems hokey and obscure. It endures mainly, I think, because it is still relevant to our experience. What Schwed has done is capture fully, in deceptively simple language, the lunacy at the heart of the investment business, the widely held belief that there is someone out there who can tell you how to turn a little money into a lot quickly. If there is a guiding principle in what follows, it is that the subject of choosing profitable investments does not lend itself to competence. There is almost no visible supply. And yet many people give investment advice and more receive it. What should we make of their activity? Having seen the business of investing firsthand, Fred Schwed decided that he was far more amused than outraged. The broker influences the customer with his knowledge of the future, he wrote, but only after he has convinced himself. The worst that should be said of him is that he wants to convince himself badly and that he therefore succeeds in convincing himself generally badly. That Schwed chose not sin but folly as his subject probably has as much to do with his temperament as it did with Wall Street. He was the son of a short seller who went bankrupt in the bull market of the 1920s. He lived most of his adult life in Rowayton, Connecticut, which he called the Athens of South Norwalk. He preferred golf and drinking to work and wrote only a few things, of which the best known today is a children's book called Wacky the Small Boy. His obituary in the New York Times in 1960 drew upon a self-portrait he had penned for a dust jacket. 182 pounds, formerly, curly brown hair and many photographs taken before World War II, owe oh, everything to my mother and small amounts to others, am fond of good clean fun, if anyone can suggest good clean fun that does not cause shortness of breath. He must have enjoyed his own book. Michael Lewis, 1995 Introduction to the 1995 Bull Market Edition This book first appeared 15 years ago, when conditions in the financial markets were different from what they are today, and so were the conditions in the author. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, as the French say. Never more than now have I wondered just what that means. Not many books are remembered after 15 years, but of the people who had any interest in Wall Street in 1940, I happen to know that a good many of them can recall this one. Not all these people bought or read the book or even glanced at Mr. Arno's cartoons. In my travels I have found that the number of people who know of this book but have never happened to purchase a copy is remarkable. In all this time, rarely has no eye lighted up when I casually rammed where are the customer's yachts into the conversation. This immortality is all attributable to just five words out of a 40,000-word text, the five words of that title. It is fitting that at this time I divulge the wellsprings of my inspiration concerning it. The little story from which it derives is printed on page 36. I had heard the gag shortly after getting my first job in the street in 1927. So did everyone else who ever got such a job. It laid buried in my subconscious for a dozen years. After all, it is not the sort of story that can be told in mixed company, because everyone in mixed company has heard it before. Then I included it somewhere in my first draft of manuscript. My editor, Mr. Jack Goodman, wrenched it out of there and stuck it on the book's spine. I recall I objected violently, but to no avail as usual. I had recently learned from my brother, an expert on copyright law, that a title cannot be copyrighted. Thus I had planned to have my book appear under a good title, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Soon after the book was published and generally advertised, I received a flattering amount of mail from old Wall Street hands calling me a plagiarist. One of them, however, was courteous about it and competent, too. This elderly gentleman had taken the trouble to send along a photostat of a periodical called The Tatler, published in San Francisco in the year of my birth. The remark had been murmured, I read with fascination, by a Mr. Travis, a wit who was only then less famed than Wilson Meisner. I learned that Mr. Travis had a slight stammer, 
which made more engaging what he had to say on a cold, windy day while shivering next to the aquarium. With proper scholarship, the title should have been called Where Are the c, -C customers Yachts? One thing is clear to me, the joke I selected to swipe had merit from the start. Jokes with less merit do not live on for half a century, with or without my assistance. My favorite review of the book, indeed my favorite review of any book by anybody, was supplied by Frank Sullivan. I was not acquainted with Mr. Sullivan then or now, but his review caused us two economists to have a brief correspondence. In his review, he wrote in part, Mr. Schwed thinks Wall Streeters are incurable romantics and children at heart. Well, aren't we all? I suppose I was an adult that day in 1937 when I bought Pennsylvania Railroad at 40. Wall Street could probably do with a lot more such antic philosophers. If I were J.P. Morgan, and I have no reason to suspect that I am not, I would invite Fred Schwed Jr. to become a partner forthwith. So I sat down and wrote thoughtfully to Frank Sullivan, care of the New York Herald Tribune Books. My dear Mr. Sullivan, I thank you for your excellent review of my recent book. However, the matter I wish to take up with you as soon as possible is not a literary matter at all. I was deeply interested in the part where you said that if you were Mr. J.P. Morgan, you would invite me to become your partner, and you indicated that there was far more than a possibility that you were actually Mr. Morgan. I will be frank with you. Where I happen to be employed now, business is not quite so hot as could be desired. A Morgan partnership could be construed as a distinct improvement, or at least an upward step in my career. Thus I find that my future is inextricably bound up with your identity. I would like you to go over yourself carefully and determine once and for all if you're Morgan the wonderful financier or still just Sullivan the wonderful comical writer. Of course, if it turns out that you haven't got a big black mustache, all our dreams come tumbling down. If you can help me in this, I have a return proposition to offer you. If at any time in the future it turns out that I am Mrs. Ogden Reed, I will hire you as chief editorial writer of the New York Herald Tribune at any salary which you care to name. That is, of course, any salary within reason, as you no doubt understand. Sincerely, etc. I promptly got back a reply from, alas, Sullivan, who, as it turned out, he actually was. The letter was sharply disappointing, and I threw it away. But I remember to this day his main point. He politely wrote that to require me to become Mrs. Ogden Reed would be asking for too much effort on my part. However, if I would just do something simpler and put Pennsylvania Railroad Common back to 40, he would be eternally grateful. It was but the work of a moment to get a quote on Pensy. It was at the time 11 and a quarter minus one half. I felt a chill of discouragement sweep over me, and I said to myself, ah, the heck with it. As I write this in the spring of 55, I note that I seem to be pushing it back to 40 for him. When it was first suggested that this year would be a proper occasion to get out a new edition, I craftily thought to myself, yes, and I will reread my book carefully and gently remold such opinions as have not entirely withstood the acid test of time, a whole fifteen years of it. But after thought I have decided boldly to cry, Stet, let it stand as long as it has stood, including a misspelling of one of the best-known banking institutions of the country. Wonder if they've fired that proofreader yet. What this edition should be is a memoir of how things appeared to me fifteen years ago, after I had been toiling in those perpendicular vineyards for nearly fifteen years before that. A memoir does not require retouching. To do so mars its merits as a memoir. A man like myself chooses the honest way the easy way. The year the book was written was a sluggish one in Wall Street with stocks at low prices, nearly as low as they ever were since the First World War. Since very few people are emotionally stirred by low stock prices, the interest of the public in Wall Street at that time was about the same as its interest then and now in court tennis. Only a few traditionally wealthy families take an interest in low stock prices or in court tennis. 
So the tape moved along like an unbabbling brook, and the brokers had time for backgammon and even book writing. But in the previous years that I served in that galley with an outboard motor, I had seen just about everything, most of it with wild surprise. First, I was privileged to watch the last three years of the so-called Incredible Twenties. And why are they still called Incredible? Then I suddenly had an excellent seat for the crash, a period of three months, an episode as vivid, tragic, and dramatic as has occurred in our history. Shortly later, I was forced to be an unwilling spectator and participant in the Depression. This was far more tragic and had only the wretched dramatic values of a drab nightmare. It was a dream horrifying and uninteresting at the same time. It seemed to the men of importance, many of them good men, contrary to the popular conception, as impossible to cope with as is any other nightmare before the terrified dreamer can wake up. Then the new president, a man I have generally admired, reopened the banks, using eight of the most effective words ever uttered on the radio. He had previously closed them with valid reason. The nightmare ended with the blink of an eye, as does any other. About four years later, in the last half of 1937, there was another little panic, but it was neat and orderly. For the next four years, nothing much happened in Wall Street, and continued not to happen, day after day, until Pearl Harbor. I speak here, one must understand, strictly of Wall Street. Way out there in the world, plenty had happened. Shortly after that, I left Wall Street, and I believe it was the next day that stocks began going up. They have continued to go up, with all but negligible interruptions ever since. Probably there is no connection. I have never gone back to the street professionally, but I have gone back sometimes as a customer, the chief difference, one might think, is that I no longer receive a salary for going down there. But no, the real difference is one of the attitude of the street to me. Now, when I saunter into a brokerage office at half-past eleven, no frenetic superior howls at me for being tardy or stupid, though in my role of customer I have often been both. The cheerful, albeit respectful courtesy that I invariably receive these days sometimes borders on the fawning especially if there is something in my bearing that suggests I might be in the mood to trade in fifty shares of something. If there is anything in the old edition that can be criticized except one misspelling and some immature remarks, it would perhaps be the chapter on investment trusts, as they were then universally called. I seem to have taken a slightly patronizing tone in discussing them. Ever since my mild ironies have appeared in uncancelable type, these corporations have steadily increased in value. There is infinitely more significance to the rise of these corporations than to any of the more spectacular leaps of some individual stocks during the same period. The vast bulk of them, and now they are vast, are open-end investment companies, now named mutual funds. Mutual funds are rarely bought at an investor's whim, the management has hard-working and persuasive salesmen out, digging into new territory all over, not just in the stock-conscious coastal areas and big cities. They call on people and explain the advantages of their wares and answer questions. They call again if they are given any encouragement. They call again if they are not given any encouragement. They can properly compare to life insurance salesmen. You remember the life insurance guy. First he was a minor nuisance. Then he became loathsome. Then he pushed a policy down your throat. Then, a decade or two later, you view your policy fondly and congratulate yourself on being such a responsible citizen and family man. The way things have gone for fifteen years, it can easily be argued that the mutual fund salesmen have done their reluctant clients an even greater boon than did the life insurance salesmen. Anyway, so far... I note at least in my defense that on my page 67 there appeared a footnote that suggested that investment trust was an unhappy and inaccurate designation and that something better should be invented. This has been done, and nobody so far has thanked me. A further small irony is that when I set down my small ironies on the subject, I happen to be the beneficial holder of shares in a good investment trust. 
These shares, being a closed-end company, had not been sold to me by a salesman. I had purchased them, on my own judgment or whim, on the New York Stock Exchange. A few years later, observing that they had all but doubled in value, I judged that this was ridiculous, and sold them, via the New York Stock Exchange, to some faceless stranger who was a fool for luck. I also did this on my own judgment. My crafty plan was to repurchase them after they had gone down to some more sensible level. As it happened, I never repurchased them because they never went down. Where they have gone up to, I don't feel in the mood to discuss just now. For my only comment on my second transaction, I must go beyond the confines of the ordinarily rich English language. Oi! Probably no reader has ever been so rude as to inquire of a professional writer on financial matters why the writer, who clearly knows so much about money, is not rich. Nevertheless, many a reader probably thinks quietly about this. Such a reader deserves some attempt at explanation, however inadequate. In my case, I have not only written airily on financial matters, but I have actually been fiddling around with common stocks most of my mature life. My passions have rarely been stirred by senior securities. And as of this writing, the common stock market has been going up for fifteen years and is at a new high since ancient Rome. Yet I haven't got a Cadillac to my name. I lay this mediocre result to the impressionableness of my youth. In those days I used to work at a trading table across from an older man, a cynical Irishman whose cynicism I secretly admired. Oft was I privileged to hear him mutter his favorite bit of logic to himself, What were securities created for in the first place? They were created to be sold, so sell them. Ever since, my tendency has been to buy stocks, all a tremble as I do so. But when they show a profit, I sell them, exultantly. But never within six months, of course. I'm no anarchist. It seems to me at these moments that I have achieved life's loveliest guerdon, making some money without doing any work. Then a long time later it turns out that I should have just bought them, and therefore I should have just sat on them like a fat, stupid peasant. A peasant, however, who is rich beyond his limited dreams of avarice. Once in the dear dead days beyond recall, an out-of-town visitor was being shown the wonders of the New York financial district. When the party arrived at the battery, one of his guides indicated some handsome ships riding at anchor. He said, Look! Those are the bankers and brokers' yachts. Where are the customers' yachts? asked the naive visitor. Ancient Story Chapter 1 Introduction The Modest Cough of a Minor Poet GBS Wall Street reads the sinister old gag is a street with a river at one end and a graveyard at the other. This is striking, but incomplete. It omits the kindergarten in the middle, and that's what this book is about. For a considerable time now, the writer has been viewing the activities of this street each working day, usually from the vantage point of a trading table. At such a table we have access to every form of communication except the heliograph. What we are constantly exchanging over the incredible network of wires are quotations, orders, bluffs, fibs, lies, and nonsense. The first four are the necessary agenda of doing brokerage and securities. The downright lies are rather exceptional and in the long run prove to be unprofitable business practice. The chief concern of this book will be with an examination of the nonsense, a commodity which keeps sluicing in through the weeks and years with the irresistible constancy of the waters of the rolling Mississippi. Wall Street professionals handle the quote-and-fib part of their business with competence, and sometimes with brilliance. Later, when the mood is on them, they add their thoughts, still under the impression that they are doing an important day's work. We shall also try not to neglect the nonsense contributed freely by customers, legislators, the press, and the public. I can recall that even on my very first day in Wall Street, early in 27, I heard considerable foolishness. 
I didn't spot it for that then or for some time thereafter. This might have been because I had trained for the profession, as had so many others, with an intensive course in the liberal arts, with emphasis upon the romantic poets of the nineteenth century. But I can't honestly testify that the boys who took commercial courses awoke from their dreams one bit sooner than we beauty lovers did. On that first day of employment I was told to look about and acclimate myself. I observed a gentleman buy two hundred shares of something at eleven o'clock. At half-past two he sold it, and willingly calculated for me his profit, which was five hundred and sixty dollars. Naturally, I stood and watched this operation quite pop-eyed, with a vague sense of pleasure. After the market had closed, I timidly approached some of the office pundits and asked where that money had come from, and had anybody lost it when the man won it. I received a number of prompt and windy answers, none of which was correct. One gray-thatched nester explained to me in a simple and kindly manner that the customer had made this money and that the shorts had lost it. A younger man said that that was silly, it was, that no one had lost it, that it was a natural increment accompanying the expansion of American prosperity, which had apparently expanded at least $560 worth right under my nose in a few hours. A third man confided to me that the customer had made this profit quite easily by merely following an indelibly indicated trend. A fourth said, emphasizing his pronunciamento by tapping me on the chest with a well-manicured finger, Young man, a bull makes money, a bear makes money, but a hog never makes anything. This last statement, while startling and intriguing, did not seem relevant to my question even then. It took me some time to discover it to be particularly untrue. I have heard it often since. It is a sort of customer's man's chanty to encourage customers to step into and out of the market a little livelier. Such expressions as the above are mild and simple samples of financial thinking. They might be called boardroom economics. Statistical department economics are much more profound, or anyway more complicated. The reader will not get much of those in this book. The reason is that I wouldn't discuss economic profundities if I could, and besides I can't. My method of dealing with those subjects which I have never been able to understand will be to omit them, though this is not the customary method of writers on financial topics. Please realize that if I am asked to define national prosperity, or to give a recipe for attaining it, or to discuss its relation to our present gold holdings, I can begin vaporing as quickly as the next fellow, but it would be twice-breathed vapor, not my own, and for all I have ever been able to make out, mostly vapor when it was new. Although not a deep thinker myself, I have had a thousand separate lunches with those who were. Authoritative figures, compiled by the National Association of Laundries, will show conclusively that there is no school of economic thought which hasn't marked up a tablecloth with huge numbers in an effort to show me the way to financial salvation. Sometimes the salvation was for my country, sometimes just for me. Books about Wall Street fall into two categories which may respectively be called the admiring or oh my school and the vindictive or turn the rascals out school. Needless to say, the former were all written formerly, and the latter, latterly, the dividing line being around October 1929. Neither school essays more than a few pounds of open-mindedness to the ton, and that noble occupation, deep thinking, continues to be, as ever, mostly second-guessing. This book will try to avoid being classified in either school. The writer has no warm emotional regard for any set of economic theories, and I am not in the pay of either Moscow or the interests. There will be found in this work a scandalous lack of statistical proof. There will be no sentences beginning, 
In this connection, it is significant to note that reliable figures compiled by a prominent school of business administration revealed that in the first quarter of 1938, $218,350,626.55, or eight and a quarter percent of the total income of families of four or more, including at least one wage earner, but exclusive of any money derived from dividends or rents, etc., etc., etc. One can't say that figures lie. But figures, as used in financial arguments, seem to have the bad habit of expressing a small part of the truth forcibly and neglecting the other part, as do some people we know. A case in point is that preferred stock you bought as an extra safe investment several years ago when the salesman showed you that the stock was earning its dividend more than fifty times over. And then one day you found that this preferred stock was not earning its dividend five times, or even one time. It seems that both the figures and the salesman had neglected to point out the unholy size of the funded debt which was senior to your stock. Of course, in any of these complex matters, if we could be sure we had all the figures, plus all the pertinent footnotes to which a greater or lesser extent invalidate most of the figures, then we would certainly have something, even if it were only the blind staggers. On the descriptive side, a plucky effort will be made to describe the people and operations of Wall Street as they really are. We already have the descriptions from the two schools of writers I have mentioned. We have further, in great plenty, descriptions proffered by the presidents of exchanges, by spokesmen for great banks and industries, by new dealers, old dealers, and the SEC, by thoughtful radicals writing in ivy-covered towers, and by informal but enthusiastic radicals shouting from soapboxes in Columbus Circle and Union Square. There is nothing surprising in the conclusion that they can't all be right. But it is surprising that no one of them is ever quite right. The best explanation is that some of them don't know what they're talking about, and those who do don't tell all they know or don't permit themselves to believe all that they know. To borrow a term from professional wrestling, they don't level with us. And this is true of both the left and the right. The Validity of Financial Predictions On the theoretic side, our chief preoccupation will be with an inquiry which is quite simple, but which is more awful in its implications than any Senate investigation. It has to do with what has become the major part of the business of Wall Street, the foretelling of price moves. Concerning these predictions, we are about to ask, one, are they pretty good? Two, are they slightly good? Three, are they any damn good at all? Four, how do they compare with tomorrow's weather prediction you read in the paper? Five, how do they compare with the tipster horse race services? The best way for us to pursue our researches in these questions is to hop a subway downtown. All subways run to Wall Street. It is a really important place. We emerge into that famous maze of canyons, the deepest and sheerest in the world. Then, through a set of great doors which never cease revolving, and we are whisked upward in a high-speed elevator. In a few moments, we are cliff-high above the teeming street, ready to sample our first financial prediction. We find it in a comfortable boardroom, where the fascinating symbols and figures glide seductively across the translux. It is, looks like there will be a little rally after lunch. This is proffered by young Mr. Joseph Weisenheimer, assistant order clerk, who has had two years at Central High. He is leaning against the ticker box, chewing gum, and looking shrewd. He has dropped this little nugget of matured wisdom into a surrounding nest of customers, many of whom are as impressionable as subdebs. At that, the odds against his being correct are hardly worse than two to one against him. When that fateful moment arrives, the conclusion of lunch, it is safe to say that the market will either be higher or lower or unchanged. We now leave these friendly quarters and enter the portals of a suite that smacks more of the cathedral than of commerce. We progress with increasing difficulty past receptionists, 
beautiful secretaries, and scholarly young acolytes to the gleaming mahogany desk of S. Hugo Big. Here we garner thought number two, which has just been prepared by Mr. Big himself, and will immediately go out on all wires. Skipping down to its conclusion, it therefore becomes clear that over the period of the next fifteen years, the investment demand for sound convertible issues bearing a low coupon but carrying an attractive conversion feature will find such deserved popularity with the long-sighted investor as to cause the more classic forms of indenture to look to their laurels. Now, the question is, which of these two statements is the sillier? Either of them, you understand, might be correct. And both of them, or statements much like them, have sold billions of dollars' worth of securities. Perhaps you veer toward thought, too, because onomatopoeically it has a sillier sound. This I hardly think is fair. Young Joe doesn't know so many long words. But he claims that he is saying something that has some meaning, and he claims it just as definitely as Mr. Big. The latter, having been to the business school at Harvard, and also having taken courses in English literature, can make his statement sound sillier. But since neither of them has any factual or causal basis for saying either of these things, I claim the honors are even. Now it should be said here that neither of these men is a liar or even a faker. If you ask Joe why there will be a little rally after lunch, he will tell you in no uncertain terms. He will say that he observes that the volume is decreasing on the downside, that he can see that steels are strongly pegged just above the last previous lows, and that they, whoever they are, are beginning to accumulate second-grade carriers. But it won't go very far, he may add, proving that at heart he is no wild-eyed optimist, more the old-line banker type. They wouldn't want to see this market run away. It is a marvelous thing the way this lingo is universally used in boardrooms, not just in New York, but from coast to coast. It is as though someone had invented an Esperanto for saying nothing in a variety of ways. And if you ask Mr. Big on what he predicates his fifteen-year opinion, he will give you so many reasons you will wish you had not asked. But he ought to know better. If he should ever lift his nose out of the minutia of his fascinating business and view it and its history whole, he would be forced to admit the sad truth that pitifully few financial experts have ever known for two years, much less fifteen, what was going to happen to any class of securities, and that the majority are usually spectacularly wrong in a much shorter time than that. Still, he is not a liar, nor is our other friend. I can explain it, because I have not only had lunch with economists, but I have sometimes had dinner with psychiatrists. It seems that the immature mind has a regrettable tendency to believe, as actually true, that which it only hopes to be true. In this case, the notion that the financial future is not predictable is just too unpleasant to be given any room at all in the Wall Streeter's consciousness. But we expect a child to grow up in time and learn what is reality as opposed to what are only his hopes. This, however, is asking too much of the romantic Wall Streeter, and they are all romantics, whether they be villains or philanthropists, else they would never have chosen this business, which is a business of dreams. They continue to dream of conquests, coups, and power for themselves or for the people they advise. Some Wall Street men manage to shed these dreams, given sufficient years, but the ultimate dream they almost never shed, that there is a secret, meaningful and predictable, in the rise and fall of financial enterprises, that a close study of this and that will prove something, that it will tell the initiate when there will be a rally, or give the speculator a better-than-even chance of making a killing, or guarantee for an estate a safe four percent for a few generations. All these things are demonstrably unpredictable. You can easily check this from your own experience, or by other people's experience, or by looking over the factual matter in the indignation books. But this cup of tea is too bitter for a Wall Streeter.
the passion for prophecy. The genesis of Wall Street was a buttonwood tree under which buyers and sellers used to meet. That tree perfectly fulfilled the pure function of a marketplace. It was a known spot where a man could go to do financial business. A necessary code of procedure for trading was recognized. But soon the brokers moved into nearby coffee houses and began adding the business of prophecy to the business of brokerage. The next thing that happened was that the prophecy business almost swamped and ruined the brokerage business. The croupier at the roulette table does not claim that he knows something about the order in which the numbers will come up. He just sees to it that the bets are properly paid off and that the house isn't chipped, which is a job requiring confidence. But it is hard to find a Wall Street man, from the oldest partner to the youngest runner, who is willing to be just a croupier. This causes a great deal of anguish in the long run, and the reasons for it are both human and economic. For one thing, customers have an unfortunate habit of asking about the financial future. Now, if you do someone the signal honor of asking him a difficult question, you may be assured that you will get a detailed answer. Rarely will it be the most difficult of all answers, I don't know. The average male likes to sit at breakfast and tell his wife and children what Adolf Hitler is going to do month after next. This is a harmless vanity, but from this it is an easy step for him to go downtown and start telling people what United States Steel is going to do month after next. That is liable to lose someone's life savings for him. On the economic side, there is no denying that the more financial predictions you make, the more business you do, and the more commissions you get. That, we all know, is not the right way to act at all. But I doubt if there are many, if any, Wall Streeters who sit down and say to themselves coolly, Now let's see, what cock and bull story shall I invent and tell them today? I don't think you can supply any guarantee of accuracy when looking into the heart and mind of someone else. But I feel from years of personal observation that the usual thought process is far more innocent. The broker influences the customer with his knowledge of the future, but only after he is convinced himself. The worst that should be said of him is that he wants to convince himself badly, and that he therefore succeeds in convincing himself, generally badly. The runners, the young fellows, sometimes old fellows, who hustle through the financial district delivering securities and calling for checks, have at least as many opinions about future prices as the oldest partner, although they have nothing whatever to gain by having them. You can hear them in the elevators, acting as unpaid investment counsel to the elevator operators. But the best proof of the predictor's confused sincerity is that they are constantly sampling their own medicine. At the present time, the Securities and Exchange Commission is still formulating new rules in an attempt to limit this convincing form of harakiri. When a great and sagacious financier dies and the executors go through the strong box, they usually find, tucked well away in the back, bundles of the most hopeless securities whose very names have been long since forgotten. Although these executors will never leave an estate worth a tenth as much as this one, they gaze at the bundles with wonder and amusement. Golly, they say, whatever could the old man have been thinking of to get stuck with these cats and dogs? When the Bull Jumped Over the Moon It may be observed that while arguing my case against the validity of financial predictions, I have not touched on the most spectacular example the late twenties, the supreme miscalculation of this century, which Mr. Westbrook Pegler always refers to as the era of wonderful nonsense. I have avoided this for several reasons. For one thing, it is too easy and has been cited too many thousand times by people who, ten years ago, were, like everyone else, its dupes. For another thing, it was not, in all respects, Wall Street's error. It was one of the great universal delusions of history, somewhat comparable to such magnificent errors as that the world was flat, or that all you had to do to heal anybody of anything was to bleed him. 
There is a feeling in some quarters that even in the late twenties there were crafty Wall Streeters who knew the market was too high. Sure there were, but it didn't do many of them much good. Mr. Andrew Mellon was heard to murmur something to the effect that gentlemen prefer bonds, but it was not established whether this was his considered advice or a belated entry into wittiness. Mr. Roger Babson had predicted the crash for several years, which shows, among other things, that he had been very wrong for several years before he suddenly became very right. There was always a scattering of bears, againers by temperament, who spent their business days having their ears knocked off, many of them bowing to a force which finally seemed cosmic, switched to being bulls at a sadly late period in the era. The remainder of who were still short at the time of the crash covered too soon, as who wouldn't. Then, after prices had gone inconceivably lower, they took their profits and bought stocks, as who wouldn't. In due course of time, if they bought on margin, they went to the cleaners, that mythical establishment to which their brother speculators had repaired some time earlier. The cleaners was not one of those exclusive clubs by 1932, everybody who had ever tried speculation had been admitted to membership. Chapter 2 Financiers and Seers To catalog all the different jobs in Wall Street would be lengthy rather than interesting. The subdivisions of functions are endless. For instance, the technique of trading government bonds over telephones is distinctly different from trading real estate bonds over telephones. In 1929, I knew a boy who received $25 a week for untangling telephone cords on a large trading desk. If that wasn't prosperity, what was? Let's consider some of the broader classifications. We might as well start at the top and work down a not unusual Wall Street method of pursuing a career. First, there is the cream of the crop, the truly conservative banker. Big banking. Nice work if you can get it. The conservative banker is an impressive specimen, diffusing the healthy glow which comes of moderation in eating, living, and thinking. He sits in state and spends his days saying, with varying inflections and varying contexts, No. He is at the top or close to the top, of one of those financial empires whose destinies have been guided with such prudence, shrewdness, and soundness that today the great house has darn near as much money and prestige as it had in 1900. He says yes only a few times a year. His rule is that he reserves his yeses for organizations so wealthy that if he said no, some other banker would quickly say yes. His business might be defined as the lending of money exclusively to people who have no pressing need of it. In times of stress, when everybody needs money, he strives to avoid lending to anybody, but usually makes an exception of the United States government. Likewise, in prosperous times, he is a mighty liberal lender, so liberal that years later unfriendly committees ask him what he thought he was thinking about, and he is unable to remember clearly. With all this, I believe he does the best job of the lot. Years have gone by, and he hasn't been indicted. There haven't even been any bad scandals. Some of the accounts haven't lost anything, and the others have at least lost their money gradually, not suddenly. When the great man is asked for investment advice, he immediately picks out something AAA. The income from this will be at a very small rate, but that won't matter, only provided the investor is as rich as the banker. Investments of this type have only a very small chance of going down in value and no chance of going up. If the cost of living should rise, the investor may find that he is having difficulty with his rent and groceries, but he will have nothing specific with which to reproach the banker. His bonds will still be quoted at a figure not shockingly below what he paid for them. Your truly conservative banker cannot be stampeded into unwary speculations by the hysteria of a boom. He reminds me a little of what I once heard one doctor say to another. 
He doesn't know enough medicine to do a patient any harm. He sits tight through 26, 27, and 28. Unfortunately, he begins to come into the market in 29. He begins cautiously enough, like an old maid trying out lipstick in the privacy of her room, watching these young whippersnappers make fortunes for three long years, does something to the sturdiest character. But he pulls out again, and while a nice piece of money is lost, no one is ruined. He apologizes to himself for having had a human moment, and resumes his thirty-year policy of listening attentively and saying, No. Way back, generations ago, when it was smart to be tough, the original hundred millions were gathered together in some more realistic business, say, selling fire water to the Indians. And these present grandsons of fortune, sitting up there in a courteous trance, are perhaps not so dumb as they look. I just suspect that they, too, consider that buying and selling securities is a poor occupation, at least for the customer. But they don't publish tracts explaining this to the public. They just personally avoid it as much as they can without losing the franchise. After these great and established bankers come all sorts of lesser bankers. The lesser bankers are under the unfortunate necessity of saying yes more frequently. This is because the ideal borrowers, people who don't need the money, do not come to them. Their clients need the money, and the lesser bankers must occasionally get it for them, or else close up shop and, God forbid, go home and relax. Like most other Wall Streeters, bankers suffer from the inability to do nothing. Your average Wall Streeter, faced with nothing profitable to do, does nothing for only a brief time. Then, suddenly and hysterically, he does something, which turns out to be extremely unprofitable. He is not a lazy man. Prosperous brokers labor under a constant urge to become non-prosperous bankers. The reasons for this are obscure. Probably it is a sort of social climbing. But it is a sad sight. Here we have a broker who for years has been collecting bushel baskets of nice little commissions. Suddenly we find himself blossoming forth as a minor banker. He is gathering together half a million dollars, largely from himself and his mother-in-law. With these funds he will promote the manufacturing sale of a new fuel for automobiles which is cheaper than gasoline, odorless and non-inflammable, but which, it later turns out, will not make an automobile run except on very warm, windless days. Some Assistant Tycoons The public has very little chance to enjoy personal contact with great bankers because of the unfortunate fact that so few of the public are rich. It is easier for a poor man to go through the eye of a needle than it is for him to get past a rich man's receptionists. We shall now take up some categories of financial men who are easier to see. Such are partners, customers' men, heads of trading departments, and statisticians. Even here the tendency is for important partners to be accessible only to the larger accounts, and so on down the scale to the least successful customers' man, who is only too anxious to talk to anybody about anything. A customers' man whose phone rarely rings does not look well sitting at a desk gazing into space. He should take up some outside interest, like college football, and discuss this topic in a low voice over the phone with his friends. It tends to spruce up his appearance, and the offices, too. All these gentlemen have needful functions in which they should be engaged. Unfortunately, such is their zeal that they not only perform their functions, but throw in a line of prophecy for good measure. Statisticians should be gathering statistics, and wire traders should be busy with the fine art of wire trading. Partners have many difficult administrative problems besides acting as customers' men for their own clients. The proper activity of a customer's man is to keep his clients informed as to what is happening and what has happened. To these services he insists on adding, as I have complained already, his notions of what is going to happen. So do nearly all the others, and the property damage that results compares favorably or dismally 
with that caused by the Japanese beetle. Partners have private offices, sometimes paneled in attractive hard woods, in which to have their thoughts, while the customer's men have to spawn theirs in public out in the boardroom. The type of customer who habitually sits in a boardroom is frequently just a gent who loves to chat in masculine company but doesn't belong to a club. This makes the boardroom a difficult place for profound thinking. Nevertheless, the customer's men manage to reach the same unfortunate conclusions as the partner's. I hold in sincere admiration those men who successfully make markets and trade on the wires, i.e. by telephones, teletype, and telegram. It is a technical sort of game requiring a number of special talents, including memory, mathematics, reputation, and the ability both to make bluffs and to see through them. The more skillful of these traders can and do peer into the future for a period of five or even twenty minutes concerning those securities which they are actively trading. This short-term peering is a legitimate function because plenty of hints are pouring into them all the time on many wires. However, as soon as they get a moment of leisure, they try peering into the future for five or ten months. For this, they are precisely as ill-equipped as everyone else. The statisticians are housed way down the hall in scholarly quiet. No noisy ticker or loquacious customers are allowed to intrude, and the thinkers are surrounded by tomes of reference and the latest news flashes from everywhere. They all carry slide rules, which, as everyone knows, are more scientific than divining rods. They make exhaustive studies of many a special situation and eventually get to know absolutely everything about the affairs of a certain corporation, except perhaps one detail, which is that shortly after the inception of the ensuing fiscal year, the corporation is going into 77B. When a statistician works up a sufficient reputation for profundity, he is graduated and becomes an economist. There was one economist who never went anywhere without his many briefcases, which were the fattest and heaviest known to the fiscal world. He was in big demand and attended conferences all over, but he was not an athletic type, so office boys had to lug the briefcases. I once found myself in an elevator with one of these boys. He was sagging under the briefcases and looked like a melancholy dray horse. Those belong to Mr. Z? I asked. Uh-huh, he replied with no enthusiasm. Listen, I said, here is an idea. Why don't you kids paste a little strip of paper inside the zippers? Then you could find out whether he ever opens those briefcases. We did, said the moody office boy. He don't. Some statisticians have to write weekly and even daily market letters. This is a tough way to make a living. It not only requires the constant making of predictions, but it requires putting the predictions down on paper for anyone interested to check up on. Sometimes these letters come back with a jug of mustard and a forcible suggestion that the writer apply the mustard to his letter and eat it. Statisticians of a nervous, sensitive sort, after a few such experiences, develop a prose style which would make a German 19th century metaphysician envious. Here is a favorite I clipped out of the Wall Street Journal once and have carried around proudly until it is almost as illegible as it is incomprehensible. The journal printed it under the questionable heading, Market Ideas. A leading brokerage house says, during a slow rise from April lows which carried the Dow Jones Industrial Average from approximately 121 to the 139 level, the action of the market was regarded as in the nature of a technical recovery, with little thought of the imminence of dynamic action. Resistance, as expected, was encountered just under 140, but after a one-day decline, volume dwindled, and the market presently appears to be engaged in a somewhat hazy consolidation movement, and perhaps searching for dynamic forces which will encourage broad-gauge buying and the resulting demolition of resistance barriers. If the thoughtful reader will now read that statement backwards, he will discover that its original lucidity is not impaired. I have composed a guitar accompaniment to go with it, beginning with that mystic section, and the market presently appears. 
The piece is surprisingly effective and will be used as the underlying motif in a forthcoming surrealist ballet. The Fruit on the Blossom of Thought When they do express opinions, the statisticians and economists manage to come to the same general conclusion as do the partners and the customers' men. If these conclusions can be generalized, the underlying principle may be loosely stated thus. Buy them when they are up, and sell them when the margin clerk insists upon it. It is obviously impossible for the thinking Wall Streeter to avoid acting on that principle. He certainly can't buy them when they are down, because when they are down, conditions are terrible. You can't ask an experienced Wall Street man to buy stocks when car loadings have just hit a new low and unemployment is at a peak and steel capacity is less than half of normal and that a very big man, of course I can't tell you his name, has just informed him in confidence that one of the big underwriting houses in the Middle West is in really serious trouble. Unfortunately for everyone concerned, these are the only times when stocks are down. When conditions are good, the forward-looking investor buys. But when conditions are good, stocks are high. Then, without anyone having the courtesy to ring a warning bell, conditions get bad. Stocks go down, and the margin clerk sends the forward-looking investor a telegram containing the only piece of financial advice he will ever get from Wall Street, which has no ifs or buts in it. Wall Street Semantics There are a couple of common phrases. Wall Street Semantics There are a couple of common phrases which do their share in perpetuating this ancient vicious practice of buying them when they are high and selling them when they are low. These two phrases are the usual reply to the inquiry, What is the market doing? The answering phrases are, it is going up, or it is going down. I wish that instead of finding a new name for customer's man, someone would find a proper predicate to take the place of these two. The nearest I can suggest is, up to this moment transactions have been occurring at continuously higher prices. But that is too wordy. It is a fair thing to say of a piston, an elevator, or a golf ball at a certain moment that it is going up. This suggests not only that it has been going up, but that it will probably continue to go on up for a little time at least, because whatever impulse started it is still operating to some extent. But it is not a fair thing to say of the stock market, which, not being a physical thing, is not subject to Newton's laws of propulsion or inertia. Unfortunately, most of us unconsciously credit this false analogy. Thus we are not tempted to buy unless they are going up, or to sell unless they are going down. But when the market is going up like fury, there is no reason to believe that the very next tick is more likely to be up than down. But that, children, is how Grandfather got himself whipsawed, as the Pharaoh players say. Chartists I have purposefully left for separate consideration the chart readers, a small, passionate sect. Their business definitely is to predict the future, and if they are unable to do this, they will have to find some other employment. Long-term forecasting is their raison d'etre. This writer does not believe that they can predict the future with any useful accuracy, nor can he perceive what there is in their methods which should persuade anyone to think they can. Some people, however, believe in the charts implicitly, and many more take a peculiar half-and-half -half position. Major Angus, for instance, after describing several American chart systems, concludes, in a fine burst of inconclusiveness, All of these theories are true part of the time, none of them all of the time. They are, therefore, dangerous, though sometimes useful. The same could be said of the practice of flipping a coin to determine whether one should buy or sell, all except the word useful, which doesn't seem to be admissible in either case.
Chart theories are indeed useful in bringing in a certain type of customer, but Major Angus is not referring to that. Your properly consecrated chart reader pays no attention to conditions at all, neither flood, famine, pestilence, nor war. He arms himself with a chart, the simplest sort of graph, which depicts the ups and downs in price of the market as a whole or of a commodity. This he studies well away from the news ticker. It is his claim that he can discern in this jagged line a pattern of behavior which reproduces itself and that certain of the peaks, valleys, and wobbles tell him when it is about to do it again. His technical jargon contains such phrases as head and shoulders formation, double tops, double bottoms, and breakaway gaps. This is the baldest description of charts. The subject can be spun out into extravagant complexity, and it frequently is. It is only necessary to plot into the graphs car loadings, bank clearances, government bond yields, and sunspots. There have always been a considerable number of pathetic people who busy themselves examining the last thousand numbers which have appeared on a roulette wheel in search of some repeating pattern. Sadly enough, they have usually found it. It would serve no purpose, nor would it be fair for me, an unsympathetic citizen, to try to explain the technical secrets of chart reading. I have had the subject explained to me a number of times, but perhaps I have missed some central point which would give the whole theory credence. I am far from being alone in this. Smarter men than I have often been unable or unwilling to pursue this science far. As a science, I should say that chart reading shares a pedestal with astrology, but most chart readers are educated men and have too much mental discipline to take astrology seriously. The subject seems to suffer from a lack of causation. When the student peers, however closely, at a graph of the Dow Jones averages, for instance, all he sees for certain is a history of past performances clearly and conveniently depicted. That one can, by examining the line already drawn, make a useful guess at the line not yet drawn, must be predicated on the hypothesis that history repeats itself. History does, in a vague way, repeat itself, but it does it slowly and ponderously, with an infinite number of surprising variations. But the chartists are trying to use the analogy to predict, with some precision, prices from month to to month, and for even shorter periods. It is a little reminiscent of those farmer's almanacs, which, without apology, calmly predict the weather for the next 365 days. While the editors of these almanacs have perceived, by examining past performances, that it gets hot each summer and cold each winter, they do not do at all well in calling their shots day by day. I once suggested to a chart reader who was explaining his theories to me that since I wasn't a customer, he should slip me the wink on this tripe. It was a social error. He was as deeply offended as if I had said something gross about his religion, which I suppose I had. All I was ever able to conclude from my informal studies was that chart reading is a complex way of arriving at a simple theorem. To wit, when they have gone up for a considerable time, they will continue to go up for a considerable time, and the same holds true for going down. This is simple, but it does not happen to be so. The easiest way of perceiving that it is not so is to go get a properly drawn chart and look at it. It is the popular feeling in Wall Street that chart readers are pretty occult professors but that somehow most of them are broke. A busted chart reader, however, is never apologetic about his method. He is, if anything, more enthusiastic than the solvent devotee you may run across. If you have the bad taste to ask him how it happens that he is broke, he tells you quite ingeniously that he made the all-too-human error of not believing his own charts. This naive thought comforts him, he doesn't mind so much losing his money, but it would have been more than he could stand to lose his faith in his beloved chart system.
the pay. It is now high time that we took up the matter of universal curiosity whenever any sort of commercial work is under discussion. How much do they pay those fellows? Since this subject is nobody's business, everyone is interested. As the man said after he had had the subject of relativity explained to him in a few unsuccinct phrases, and from this Mr. Einstein makes a living? Since I do not know how much money Wall Street men make, and since I can think of no reliable way of finding out, I shall promptly answer as follows. Wall Street, including such suburbs as South LaSalle Street, Montgomery Street, Market Street, State Street, Walnut Street, etc., is a community where more than 10,000 different people make more than $10,000 a year. That's more than $100 million, which, as the boys put it, is not hay. The above statement, like poetry, is merely used to suggest an idea. The idea is the debatable one that Wall Street is the highest-paying spot on the face of the earth. The statement also resembles poetry in that all its details are grossly inaccurate. The above figures have been gathered without much trouble out of the top of the writer's head. Wrong as these figures may be at the moment, they still vary exceedingly in different years. A decade ago, one could have said with more confidence that 25,000 people made more than $25,000 a year. And at other periods since then, it would have read that only a very few people managed to make even a very few dollars. It is not only the figures that are vague. The use of the verb make is impure. In common usage, to make $10,000 a year suggests that the money is earned in salaries and or commissions. But the bulk of that hundred million is not earned. It is won. And then let us not forget that frequently it is not won, it is lost. Taking all these factors into consideration, we may state with confidence that Wall Street is the highest paying spot on the face of the earth, except that maybe it isn't. The Difficulties of Earning Money There is a small percentage of talented souls who actually earn more than ten thousand. Such, for instance, are those few men with such a reputation for sagacity that they are paid a straight salary, and a large one, for advice. There are some partners and customers' men, with a large and faithful following of customers, who can be truly said to earn their generous incomes from commissions, provided they stay away from that nearby order window themselves. But now let us take the case of another man, who certainly seems to earn his keep. He is what is known as a two-dollar broker on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. His is a clean business, without any dubious or expensive odds and ends. He derives his income entirely from small commissions he receives from other brokers for executing orders for them. His office is only desk room, his staff is a clerk or two, his overhead is negligible. All his banking requirements are supplied to him for a very reasonable fee by a larger house, which clears for him. He avoids speculation for himself as he would narcotics. Since he never deals with the public, he never has anything on his conscience no matter where the market goes. Since he is efficient, dependable, and popular, he gets plenty of business. The result is that over the past ten years, he has averaged yearly net earnings of $20,000. But some ten years ago, he paid $300,000 for his seat. Not long after it was worth double that. Now it is worth less than $100,000. After ten years of faithful and successful work, we must now inquire, one, how much has he made? Two, how would it have been if he had just stayed at home with his $300,000? The above case has been cited for its stark simplicity, but neither in Wall Street nor corporate enterprise are there any accounting problems quite so simple as that. Bookkeepers and order clerks can find out what they are earning by subtracting their lunches from their salaries, but above that point, all accounting problems are grow increasingly chaotic. A large firm has many partners, many seats, 
great earning capacity, great capital outlay, amazing overhead, and all sorts of securities. Each evening the workers in the cage are not allowed to go home until the books balance. But it is frequently most difficult to ascertain whether the firm is making or losing money. I know of a banking institution whose local rule is that the bookkeepers may not go home if there is a difference of more than six cents. Nevertheless, it is quite impossible for anyone to state at any time what they are really worth within a couple of million dollars. An Art Without a Muse Accounting, some say, is not a science, but an art. One who held this view, but inarticulately, was an aged gentleman who owned a sizable department store in a Middle Western city. I offer his private method of accounting for what it is worth to any puzzled Wall Street partner or proprietor. The old gentleman was being annoyed by his sons and his auditors, who were trying to show him that while business seemed to be good, the store was actually losing money. They were awash in ledgers and statements as they strove to prove their point. Finally, the old man spoke to them. Listen, he said, the push cart that I pushed into this town forty years ago we still have. It is in the storeroom on the sixth floor. Go up and look at it. Check it off. Then everything else you see is profit. Since 1938, a not implausible argument could be presented to show that accounting is not even an art, but just a state of mind. In that year occurred those two fantastic accounting cases, McKesson and Robbins and Interstate Hosiery Mills. For some time, both corporations had flourished like the Green Bay Tree, chiefly on assets that simply weren't there, but which everyone thought were there. Everyone, that is save one man in each case who had created the assets all by himself, using only a pen, some ink, and a lot of skillful dishonesty. Presumably these corporations' securities would never have taken those two dives if only the non-existent assets had not been destroyed by having their non-existence discovered. At this point the subject should be taken away from the accountants and handed over to the metaphysicians. Bishop Berkeley propounded the classic question, If a great tree falls in the forest, does it make any noise if no one is there to hear it fall? He decided it doesn't, which for all I know is the right answer. If the bishop were living today, I believe he would be interested in this question. If a great corporation is toppling over, does it do any one financial harm if no one knows that it is toppling over? A little aptitude test. As an appendix to this chapter, I would like to give some hints as to which young men should and which should not take up finance as a career. Wall Street has always been burdened by having in its personnel a good many otherwise estimable people who don't know anything about the laws of probability and risk and not too much about arithmetic. It should not be too radical to suggest that a young man entering the street should have some special mental equipment beyond one complete set of smoking room stories about Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt. Of course, if you have a persuasive and forceful character, you can always make a big splash in the street. You can sell huge amounts of securities and put over big deals and combine great corporations. Even if you should botch these matters to a fare thee well, you will still be in demand. However, if you can wheedle, charm, cajole, or shout down others, you can make a whacking success anywhere else in commerce. So if you do not happen to be good at judging risks realistically, it would be kinder to exercise that talent in other fields. Try selling cantilever bridges or organizing the revolution. Test yourself on these six questions. If you have to hesitate in answering them, count the answer wrong. 1. Do you perceive quite clearly what is the objection to playing a roulette wheel that has two zeros on it? If not, don't bother to be a financier, be a roulette player. 2. If a man has tossed a coin heads four times in succession, 
which do you think he is more likely to toss the fifth time, heads or tails? If you think he is more likely to toss either heads or tails, look into the interior decorating game. You have that instinctive type of mentality which might do very well at that. 3. When do you consider that it is a good purchase to draw one card to an inside straight? Answer, when you are playing for soybeans. 4. If you have answered number 3 correctly, do you find that when you are actually playing poker for money, you can always resist making that draw? If not, stay home with your money and start practicing being a miser. 5. If a stock which is not paying any dividend is split two for one, how much good does that do the stockholder? If you think it does him any real good, come down and join our sales department, but steer clear of our trading department. 6. What is the primary purpose of a business enterprise? This question is specifically for young men considering entering the banking field where they will have a constant parade of business propositions passing before them, and they will be required to plump for a few of them and say no to the others. The answer is elementary and obvious. The primary purpose of a business is to make money. Almost anyone knows this with the top part of his brain, but there are only a few valuable young men who also know this all up and down their spinal column. Most businessmen imagine that they are in business to make money, and that this is their chief reason for being in business, but more often than not, they are gently kidding themselves. There are so many other things which are actually more attractive. Some of them are to make a fine product, or to render a remarkable service, to give employment, to revolutionize an industry, to make oneself famous, or at least to supply oneself with material for conversation in the evening. I have observed businessmen whose chief preoccupation was to try to prove conclusively to their competitors that they themselves were smart and that their competitors were damn fools, an effort which gives a certain amount of mental satisfaction, but no money at all. I have even seen some whose chief interest lay in proving this point to their partners. So give yourself a real good mark if you know that a business should make money but only if you really know it. Chapter 3 Customers, That Hardy Breed A customer may be loosely defined as anyone who is willing to put up some money. Lack of customers is the terrible occupational disease of brokers. First, the commissions fall off, while the overhead marches on. The next thing that almost always happens is even worse. The brokers have nothing much to do all day, and eventually even backgammon gets tiresome. So they begin to play the market themselves, using their own money instead of the customers. It is like a saloon keeper taking to drink in a slack season, and the results are about the same. I have known partners upon forming a firm to swear terrible oaths to each other that they will never operate for their own account. But the urge to become a customer is strong in everybody, even brokers. If they are stockbrokers, they may be able to resist the temptation to trade in stocks, but let someone come in with a fascinating speculation in November hides or Chinese tail, and they are off. I once heard a stock exchange member complain bitterly about his partner. He said, We would be doing all right, except for one thing. Every time I go out to lunch, some curb broker sneaks in here and sells Henry something. Varieties of Customers There are many sorts of customers besides hopeful individuals. Savings banks and life insurance companies are customers and they are the very best ones to have if you can get them. Not only is their volume of business large, but you never have to send them margin calls, because that nasty old government does not allow them to exercise their full genius as investors. Then there are many other types of corporations which are splendid customers to have, especially investment trusts and fire insurance companies. Other satisfactory types of customers are large estates or even a brace of wealthy aunts. 
A rich family finds it an attractive investment to get one or two of its younger males jobs on the strength of handling the family funds. If the firm will pay the young fellow $150 a week, that is just like investing a quarter of a million for him. However, it would be best if the young man in question be of a somewhat cynical cast of mind and more on the lazy than the ambitious side. Otherwise, he is liable to try his hand at doubling the estate, and that might be the end of the estate. A good job is worth much fine gold, but it is not worth all the gold. The great majority of customers are individuals, ranging from rich people and prosperous businessmen, who presumably know what they are doing, on down the scale. At the bottom we find a large number of tiny accounts, alternately hopeful and desperate. These people, with next to nothing in the bank and no life insurance, have fallen into the pernicious habit of owning a thousand dollars worth of common stock, against which they owe a debit balance of four hundred and some odd dollars, plus interest. This last condition was far more prevalent a few years ago, before the authorities took steps to curtail margin buying for small accounts. I have often heard it argued that this is a free country, and that if a rich man may take a flyer, why not a poor man? That is a good argument, but I still don't agree with it, and will therefore refuse to discuss it further. How to Get Customers The simplest way of getting wealthy customers, as I have indicated, is to be born unto them. Failing that, a personable young Wall Streeter can often marry them. I have known cases where it was only necessary to woo them. Some of these customers, after a long period of wooing, lose their attractiveness, both as customers and as brides. Otherwise, customers are obtained by much the same mysterious methods whereby doctors get patients and lawyers clients. This is done by circulating around and impressing people with one's talents. This can be done, for instance, by playing an expert game of bridge because this shows what a head you have on you for figuring out complex matters and winding up with more money. Oddly enough, it can be done even better by playing an expert game of golf, though this only proves that you have a strong and supple back. Non-game players have to content themselves with looking as wise as steel-rimmed pince and the natural expressions of their faces permit. All candidates stud their conversation with interesting and exciting anecdotes about how their firm sold everything out two weeks ago just before the big decline started. They had stocked up at the beginning of the year just before the sustained rise. It seems they got a confidential report from Washington. I believe they refer to Washington, D.C., not George Washington. The reason traffic moves so slowly on Lower Broadway is because it is impeded by swarms of customers' men who have never been once wrong in the last ten years, in retrospect. In 1928, I knew a customers' man named Tommy who had his own method for getting new customers. It wasn't a very good way, but it was his way. It consisted of having the desk nearest the door. Whenever a stranger came through the door, Tommy would beat the office boy to him and would ask if he could be of service. It seemed like trying to catch trout with a bent pin, but in 1928 Tommy could do it. For instance, one day there appeared a youth who bore in his hand a strange device. Tommy was on him like a flash. "'Can I do anything for you?' he asked politely. "'Well,' said the youth, I would like to see the man that I should talk to about putting a thing on the telephone so nobody can hear what you're saying except you, and it is also more sanitary. I beg pardon? I would like to see the man that I should... I'm sorry, but that man just went out to lunch, said Tommy. But won't you sit down? The youth gratefully sat down, and Tommy sold him two hundred anaconda rights. It was the beginning of a short and unprofitable association. Margin Americans find margin trading a particularly attractive little invention. It parallels the American principle that the first thing a man should do with his home, even before moving in, is to put it in hock. The idea is that he only has to pay 6% or so on the mortgage 
and if he can't wrangle something better than a measly six percent out of a round lot of money, he ought not to be in business. This is another argument I am unable and unwilling to discuss further. The idea is easily extended to margin trading. We assume that it is a wise and profitable venture to buy 100 shares of United Fido at 10, paying $1,000 for it. Ergo, wouldn't it be even better to buy 200 shares, paying the same $1,000? And even better to make it 3 or 400, if we can find a sufficiently kindly broker to do us this favor? The answer is no but I only know one way of proving it to you conclusively. Go try it. In trying it, you must use real money. Making mind bets won't do. Like all of life's rich emotional experiences, the full flavor of losing important money cannot be conveyed by literature. Art cannot convey to an inexperienced girl what it is truly like to be a wife and mother. There are certain things that cannot be adequately explained to a virgin, either by words or pictures. Nor can any description that I might offer here even approximate what it feels like to lose a real chunk of money that you used to own. Margin requirements are now universally fixed. But formerly, many customers used to shop around in different houses to see where they could buy the most stock for the least pledge of money. When they finally found the ultimate bargain, it frequently entitled them to the privilege of beginning suffering almost immediately instead of waiting a while for the thumbscrew. As Mr. Eddie Cantor phrased it years ago, they told me to buy this stock for my old age. It worked wonderfully. Within a week I was an old man. Some of the customers who went seeking slim margin requirements actually intended to act conservatively. That is, they only intended to make a quick turn for a modest profit. Also, they expected to limit themselves to a small loss, but this was more vague in their minds. It is easy to take a small profit, but taking a small loss is frequently just a good intention. Eventually, the customer finds himself throwing good money after bad until there isn't any good money left. I have heard an old line broker describe this common experience. He explained, They got on the 20th Century Limited at Grand Central Station. They only intended to ride as far as 125th Street where they would get off and visit Grandma. But the first thing they knew, they were making 70 miles an hour through Fort Wayne, Indiana. What to do when the dam bursts? If you are a customer receiving margin calls, there are a number of things you can do but none of them is good. Probably the best thing to do is to use the natural instinctive method. This consists of picking up a telephone and telling the broker to go climb up a rope or do anything else with a rope that his fancy dictates, but you won't send him any more money. This has some definite advantages, not the least of them being that it helps relieve the feelings. The broker will sell you out and will then mail you some odd change that is left over. Since this amount is too small to be put back in the bank, you will probably do something really useful with it, like putting linoleum on the kitchen floor. If the stocks that you sold out immediately start booming upwards again, you can meet that difficulty by ceasing to read the financial page. The second method is to get hold of some more money, Lord knows how, but you always can, and send it in. This is known as the finger-in-the-dike method. It is a curious and terrible thing, but for some reason it is easier for a man to raise a thousand dollars for a margin call than it is for him to raise the price of supper if he is starving. This method often works, but it is also the method used by suicides. The third method is surprisingly popular. This is the head-in-the-sand method, and is used by those many customers who have in them a strong dash of ostrich. As soon as they read in the paper that their stocks are down, they arrange not to hear about it officially. They refuse to answer telephones or accept telegrams, and in some cases actually make for the main woods. Just what they hope to gain by this procedure is problematic. What always happens is that the brokers sell them out, as they do with those using method number one. 
However, the sellout may come a little later, which means that instead of some small change remaining for the customer, the customer owes the broker the small change. Sometimes, long afterwards, the ostrich type of customer sues the broker in court, claiming that he never received proper notice of the margin call. If at that time the customer was deeply enough hidden in the main woods, he probably didn't get proper notice at that. The customer can do all right in the lower courts before a jury, because the only thing the average jury comprehends entirely in these cases is that they don't like brokers. But if any real amount of money is involved, the broker appeals the verdict, and a higher court, without a jury, tosses the customer out. I once knew of a professor of English literature who used to receive margin call telegrams which were sent collect. Not only would he put up the required margin, but he would pay for the telegrams as well. While I have in general no useful advice on what to do about margin calls, I definitely feel that you ought not pay telegram charges on them. Some Case Histories and a Diagnosis there will always be customers of a certain mentality who cannot rid themselves of the idea that the whole business is a contest between broker and customer to see which one gets the other one's money. Some of them still believe in their hearts that the money they lost in 1929 became the property of their brokers. They secretly continue to believe this after lengthy explanations. The notion that all those greenbacks just evaporated seems to them fanciful. I am still moved when I recall a gallant little customer in 1928. The market was having a sinking spell, rare for that year, and this man received a margin call for $700. This meant that the house would be pleased to get $700 because that would save wear and tear later on, but that in a pinch they could use 400 at least until the market went lower. The customer said in high excitement, Okay, okay, don't close me out, I'll get it. In quick time, a Western Union messenger arrived with $500 and a note that the rest would soon be forthcoming. At noon, another $100 appeared, and at half past one, a pathetic 25 At three o'clock, when he had been quite forgotten, he called up. You got me, he said with the quiet desperation of Billy the Kid with his last cartridge gone. I can't raise the last seventy-five. I give up. Then again, there was the customer who was wise and fabulously rich. His richness early in 1929 consisted of seven and a half million dollars, mostly gained in the past three years. His wisdom lay in this. He put a million and a half dollars into Liberty Bonds and gave them to his wife with a forceful presentation speech. My dearest, he said, these securities are now yours. They are not mine. They represent quite as much income as we shall ever really need for the rest of our lives. I shall continue to speculate and make more money, but if by any incredible chance I should ever come to you and ask for these bonds back again, under no circumstances give them to me, for you will then know that I have gone crazy. Six months later, he needed margin, further to protect the six million which, he was certain, was only temporarily gone. He went for the money to the wife of his bosom, who demurred. But he was a persuasive man. He got the bonds back, temporarily. All of the foregoing customers were afflicted with that common psychiatric disturbance, rhinophobia, or the dread of ever having any cash. Customers who suffer from rhinophobia always have as many securities as possible. When they sell out stocks at a profit, they hasten to fill the void in their accounts with other stocks. The odd part is that they are frequently economical souls who do not believe in frittering away their money on food and drink and momentary pleasure. If they play bridge of an evening for a quarter of a cent and lose seventeen dollars, they are liable to go home in a pretty depressed state of mind. Perhaps on the same day a slight weakness in the market reduced their equity five hundred dollars, but that doesn't trouble them much. They still have their beloved stocks. It is practically axiomatic for these men that every time the stock market goes bust, so do they. To them, having a sizable cash balance in an account for any length of time is unbearable. 
Suppose stocks should go way up. They would be left high and dry, with nothing but some dirty old money. Churning money as a career. Where do all the customers from time immemorial come from? Perhaps I have made it seem that it is no fun being a customer. Financially, over a period of years and taking averages, it is not. The statistics that have been gathered on this subject show that clearly enough. But man cannot live by bread alone. There are other attractions to being a customer which, for want of a better name, we shall have to call spiritual values. They arise from the following circumstances. Our society suffers dreadfully from the fact that there are so few of us who, in ourselves, have services or talents that we can sell for as much as a hundred dollars a week. A good salesman or a superb acrobat, for instance, can earn this easily enough, but few have such abilities to offer. A man who has a real chunk of capital, though, twenty-five thousand or a quarter million, expects that with this capital, plus his brains and efforts, he should command this income and a good deal more. He is quite willing to work, in fact, he insists on it. Only by working, by being in business, can he assume his dignity in the world. Only in this way will his counsels have some weight with the boys at the club, and he will have something to tell his wife when he gets home in the evening. There is nothing to scoff at in this. These values are as needful as groceries. I have set the word work in inverted commas to distinguish such an enterprise from a job of work. A job of work means earning a living by being a linotyper or an iron puddler or a floor walker or a detective. It rarely appeals to a man who has capital, and I for one can see his point. A man of capital becomes a proprietor or a partner in a business enterprise where his capital is needed. Perhaps his services are also needed, whether they are or not, he will insist on supplying them. All such enterprises, from manufacturing brasiers to underwriting marine insurance, are speculative. That is to say, his own efforts will account for as much of his success or failure, but the economic circumstances into which he runs will account for more. His capital is used in one way or the other to finance the purchase of some sort of goods. Then he performs some sort of service to the goods and looks around for a buyer and a reasonable profit. But if, while he is industriously engaged in all this, the price of these goods bounces up, he will make a huge profit, if down, a large loss. Although he is at times engaged in a thrilling speculation, he does not so much seem to be because all day long he is busy as a beaver, working. Now, an active Wall Street customer is frequently a man of capital who, like his friend uptown, also wishes his capital to return him a goodly income. He, too, is willing and eager to be a man of affairs. So he becomes a stock customer. Like his friend Uptown, he speaks crisply and esoterically over telephones. He worries just as much or more, and sometimes he even attends conferences. He differs from his friend Uptown only because he omits a couple of steps. For one thing, he does not have to learn or half-learn the technical complexities of a business. Almost anyone in a few weeks can learn how to put in orders and limit them and stop them and all the fascinating patois that goes with it. The stock customer, too, uses his capital to buy goods which he hopes to turn over at a reasonable profit. He purchases, let us say, 100 shares of American Telephone and Telegraph. Only in his case, he omits going through the busy motions of doing some service to it during the time he holds it. He neither refines it, nor retails it, nor sews buttonholes in it. He just hopes that the market for these goods will soon rise, which is pretty much what the uptown man is doing also. Is there so much to choose, ethically or economically, between the legitimate business entrepreneur and the stock market customer? Neither of them is willing to invest his capital at 3%, stay home, and take up a hobby. The figures on business enterprises are difficult to interpret fairly, as are those on the fate of customers' accounts. 
but they both strongly suggest that staying home, away from any sort of an office, has, since the turn of the century, been a shrewd thing for a man of means to do. But it was a dull life. The man who chooses to take his money and churn it furiously, either below or above Chamber Street, cannot in any way predict his fate, save for a single assurance. So long as any of the money still clings to the sides of the churn, he will not be bored. Chapter 4 Investment Trusts, Promises and Performance the basic idea of investment trusts is little short of perfect. But as we all know too well, in actual practice, American investment trusts have varied between the disappointing and the catastrophic. The whole subject makes an interesting study of the generous gap between rhetorical promise and practical fulfillment. Or, as George Ade wrote of the golfer who took a complete course of lessons, finally his form became perfect but his score had to be taken out after each round and buried. The basic idea is familiar. The average individual is incapable of handling his own financial destiny, a fact which he can easily verify for himself in the course of one lifetime. What is worse, he cannot, unless he is very rich, purchase the best financial advice. We are assuming for the moment that there is such a thing as the best financial advice. So a lot of us who clearly are not magicians pool our money and hire a set of professional experts to do the guessing. They may not be quite magicians, but they have everything that should be necessary. Experience, reputation, trained staffs, inside information, and unlimited resources for research. Since the amount we pool together is often in the neighborhood of a hundred million dollars, we can afford to pay them fortunes for their ability. Paying them fortunes will be a great bargain for us, provided only that they come across with the ability. One would think they could do this, or at least do it better than we could. If they are approached with a proposition to buy stock in some potash deposits, they don't have to take somebody's word for it at fourth hand, as you and I do. They send mining engineers out to Colorado to take a good look. They send someone else out in another direction to investigate the demand for potash. Or perhaps they are considering investing in a huge public utility corporation which has many subsidiaries, which in turn have sub-subsidiaries, which have sub-sub-subsidiaries, until its corporate structure resembles the family tree of the Forsytes. When you or I try to peer into this situation, all we get out of it is spots before the eyes. But the investment trust has a lot of Phi Beta Kappas who can figure it out as easy as pi. And if there should be anything they don't understand, they can just pick up the phone and call D.H. Muckamuck, the president of the Public Utility Corporation, on long distance. Mr. Muckamuck will talk. This inquiry will go through his protective layer of secretaries like a hot BB shot through a tub of butter. Stop making your own mistakes. If the basic investment trust idea is even half as sound as it appears to be, the average investor has virtually no excuse for buying any securities but investment trust shares. The question may be put this way, using golf again. If it was very important to you to win the Class B championship at your country club and the rules permitted you to hire Gene Sarazen at a reasonable fee to make the shots for you, wouldn't you be an egotistical fool to insist on playing the shots yourself? This would be an airtight analogy except for one thing. Mr. Sarazen is superior to you and me at playing golf, and he can demonstrate this superiority every time he steps onto the first tee. But thus far in our history, there has been little evidence that there exists a demonstrable skill in managing security portfolios. I have not used the big argument the trusts use themselves, diversification. This claim is that by buying trust shares, the modest investor is not forced to put all his eggs in one basket. This argument sounds a good deal more reasonable than it actually is. 
A widely diversified portfolio is not supposed to break downward in value very fast because all its eggs won't go bad at once. This mechanism also prevents its value going up very fast. But this safety device doesn't seem to work particularly well. When steel and motors take a dreadful fall, almost the entire diversified list of securities takes it right along with them. High-grade bonds may hold up all right, and cash on hand certainly holds up splendidly, but these trusts rarely have any large stock of either on these tragic occasions. The average small investor needs a certain amount of diversification, but he can get it himself by buying five share lots instead of hundred share lots. The added expense of doing his business this way is negligible. If his funds are too limited even for that procedure, the only diversification he needs is to put some of his money into life insurance payments, some into the savings bank, and the remainder into his right-hand trouser pocket. Where is the catch? If investment trusts would only function in actuality anything like as well as they do in theory, they would be a tremendous asset to the general welfare. A man's funds are only less important to him than his health and his rights. For their protection, he can respectively hire the services of a doctor and lawyer, and he can be assured of some reasonably competent assistance. For his mental problems, he can hire a psychiatrist and have a fairish chance of being helped, and for his plumbing problems, he can hire a plumber and be certain of help. Why can't he, through the device of the investment trust, hire a little competence on the money problem? My own guess, with which by this time the reader is perhaps too familiar, is that he can't, simply because there is practically no competence to be hired. The subject of choosing profitable financial investments does not lend itself to competence. There is almost no visible supply. If there were, it would have been discovered long ago by the larger investment trusts because they stand ready and willing to pay any amount for it. The management contracts which pay the managers are usually such that the managers are generously rewarded if they produce consistently good results. Surely the managers would be only too happy to divulge their wisdom for the benefit of the trust if only they had some wisdom to divulge. Since this explanation of why the results are disappointing is not held by many, I shall try to touch on some of the others. The chief and most popular explanation is, of course, dishonesty. There are some financial writers who have been making a modest living now for ten years beating a dead horse, i.e., continually explaining the infinite variations for thievery which arise when a group of men is in control of the handling of millions upon millions of dollars. Such opportunities for double dealing must exist in all investment trusts. All you can do is pick a management which seems to you from its record to be honest. You are facing precisely the same problem if you are merely the beneficiary of an estate which has three executors, all of them your uncles, one of whom is a lawyer, one a broker, and one a real estate operator. Your uncles may go bad on you, too, under the strain of this and that. They, like the trust managers, may succumb to conflict of interest. For instance, if an investment trust is affiliated with a banking house, there is the temptation to sell to the investment trust those securities which the banking house gave birth to and which they find they are unable to sell to anyone else. If the trust is affiliated with a member of the stock exchange, there is a temptation to trade huge amounts of stocks to the benefit of the commission account, etc., ad infinitum, ad nauseum, with variations. All of this is undeniable. But I know of many investment trusts today whose honesty I consider above suspicion. If you wish to consult me privately about this information, bring along some money. Unfortunately, I cannot guarantee whether or not they are also bright in the head. The Securities and Exchange Commission has done valuable work in scaring the living daylights out of investment trust managers. One should further consider this. The managers of an established trust with a fairish record have a responsible, well-paying, enviable job. 
it is a fairly good bet that they will not, en masse, succumb to the temptations of thievery. Few men become thieves out of pure devilment, rather they sidle into thievery under their own personal duress. And the hallucinations of the twenties are behind us. There has been a great deal of thoughtful, searching legislation enacted against trust abuses in recent years, and all of it favors the investor. The sad thing is that there can be no legislation against stupidity. I should not care to entrust what I like to think of as my funds to a smart crook or to an honest bonehead. But if I were forced to choose, I would choose the crook. With a writ of replevin and a policeman, I might be able to get back my money from the former, but all there would be for me from the latter would be a heartfelt, even a tearful apology. Taxes, like the poor, we have ever with us. The rate of tax on investment trust profits is now a ripe and juicy 18%. No doubt imposed on the theory that since a corporation has no soul, it really won't mind a murderous tax. So first the trust pays a tax, and then the lucky investor, when he takes his profit, pays another one on the same profit. This makes what the horse players call a tough book to beat. An investment trust should be good and large, because this tends to make the expenses of running it a negligible percentage of the whole. But when the trust is big in size, the investing problem becomes increasingly difficult. A 50,000 share position is a hard thing to buy, and usually a harder one to sell. If the quotation on such a position rises 20 points in the newspaper, the trust scores up a million-dollar profit on their book value. But, of course, actually realizing a profit on such a block is apt to be quite a different thing. British and Scotch investment trusts have a much better record than American. They are a great deal older, and this maturity and experience, plus certain differences in national temperament and viewpoint, is the likely explanation. The trusts abroad are more truly investing companies. That is, their aim is to conserve capital and produce income. But American trusts rarely are able to make up their own minds just what their aim is and stick to it. Many American trusts have a hankering to go after income instead of capital gains. But then the American shareholder, no Casper Milk Toast, gets impatient. Investment trust shares are created, among other purposes, to be sold. It is hard to sell Americans a proposition that hasn't got the promise of a little zip to it. The Hell Paving Construction Company Thus far we have been discussing management trusts, the kind in which a board of managers decides by reason, or something, what shall be done. Fixed trusts, of the sort that were enthusiastically spawned in the late twenties, deserve a word if only as an example of fine intentions and bad results. The basic idea in this case was to remove the factor of human fallibility, a factor which, we must all admit, certainly needs removing. Therefore, they were set up in this way. A list of the best securities was decided on once and for all. These were purchased and put into the portfolio. After that, no human hand was to touch them. One proviso was added. If they ever stopped paying dividends, they were then and there to be sold out. Automatically, both folly and dishonesty were banned. And the way this panned out, in case you haven't heard, was nothing short of cataclysmic. Long before the blue chips ceased to pay dividends, they had gone way down. Then, when they actually omitted the first dividend, all these robot trusts had to try to sell them at once. To make it a trifle worse, some nasty men, who perceived what must of necessity happen, sold short just ahead of them. The Trouble with the Best Securities That plan for automatic self-destruction is now only a footnote in financial history. But the notion of selecting the best securities still deserves a close scrutiny. Those classes of investments considered best change from period to period. The pathetic fallacy is that what are thought to be the best are in truth only the most popular, 
the most active, the most talked of, the most boosted, and consequently the highest in price at that time. It is very much a matter of fashion, like Eugenie hats or waxed mustaches. When crinolines were being worn, canal bonds were being bought. When the bustle was thought attractive, so were railroad and traction securities. To say that industrial common stocks were all the rage in the late 1920s would be to understate it, and Le Dernier Cri for the last few years has been for government bonds and tax exempts at prices calculated to yield something near zero percent. Interspersed with such major fashion trends, there appear at various times briefer foibles, sudden passion for war babies, auto stocks, radio stocks, bank stocks, real estate mortgages, convertible debentures. Here we have the basic trouble when selecting the best securities for a fixed portfolio. In fact, here we have the basic trouble with all security selection for whatever purpose. Implacably, this universal habit of buying the popular securities works for bad results over a period of time. It must tend to get the buyer in nearer the top than the middle. This also applies to managed investment trusts, to insurance companies, to trust accounts, to the advice of brokers and investment counselors, and to the efforts of private individuals. This book does not intend to take up the subject of new issue underwriting at any length, but this is the place to point out that we also have here the basic trouble with that business. Bankers strongly prefer only to float a new issue of foreign bonds when foreign bonds in general are popular. And the same goes for everything else, from gold stocks to sewer improvement notes. There are two simple reasons for this. The first is that those are the only times they have a good chance to sell the securities. And the second is that those are the only times they believe in the projects themselves. The story is told of the trust officer of the great bank and trust company who happened to shake his pen over the stock page in the newspaper. He had his staff check and see what would have happened if stocks for the trust accounts had been chosen by ink spots instead of by experts. The result showed that this method would have resulted in much less loss than that which had actually taken place. The bank had chosen the proper securities, but the flying ink drops had at least been impartial. My only reason for questioning the literal truth of this yarn is that I doubt if a trust officer could be found who would either risk the experiment or divulge the result. A more sober demonstration of the same sort appeared in a brochure issued in 1937. In this calculation, the 20 most popular stocks and bonds on the stock exchange are selected at four different periods between 1901 and 1926. The selection of the most popular was made on each occasion by choosing those in which the largest volume of trading occurred in that year. Their cost at that time was figured and compared with their value at the end of 1936. The results were extremely poor. And now, three years later, it just so happens that they are a good deal poorer. The $750,000 Bird in the terrible panic of 1929, there was a series of emergency meetings of the board of a certain managed investment trust. Late one night, white-faced, weary, and irresolute, these men faced each other around the huge mahogany table and tried to avoid each other's eyes. All their convictions were being shattered. Suddenly, one of them spoke quietly and firmly. There is no telling how far this thing is going to go, he said. Such and such, naming one of the great blue-chip stocks of the day, is down close to 200 from 350, where it was selling only two months ago. It may sound fantastic, but I believe there is a chance it may yet touch 150. If we could buy 10,000 shares at 150, don't you all think it would be the sort of bargain we may never see again? It will probably never happen, but shouldn't we be prepared if the opportunity comes? At his forceful suggestion, courage ran about the room like a licking flame. Vigorous ascents were given, and color came into wan cheeks. Put that down, said someone to the twenty-year-old order clerk who was present. Buy ten thousand such-and-such such at one-fifty, 
Order good till cancelled. The kid who was addressed obediently leaned forward to write, but as he did so he puckered his lips a little. Very low, but audibly, he gave that distinctive, rubbery sound of contempt known as the bird. Immediately everyone felt less confident. Somehow or other the discussion was reopened, and after a time the suggestion was abandoned. My informant on this matter has estimated that that little noise saved the trust a matter of three-quarters of a million dollars. But no one ever thanked the boy, because no one ever dared to admit that he had anything to do with the decision to cancel that ruinous order. By way of apology. In an effort to explain why American investment trusts have not to date lived up to their bright theoretical promise, I have thus far only listed their liabilities. This is not a fair method of debate. But I wish to spare the reader, for as long as possible, the difficulty of the country judge. The difficulty of the country judge who said plaintively, if both you young fellers speak, how do you expect I'm going to make up my mind? There are a lot of things that can be said in favor of investment trusts, but they make less interesting reading than the things that can be said against them. In fairness, we should never lose sight of the fact that our trusts have led their difficult existence almost entirely during the dreadful decade. If they all handled themselves like monkeys or worse at the end of 1929, Look about and try to find someone who handled himself better. Did you? I can't help believing that matters are conducted on a vastly better level now than they were in the bad old days of five to fifteen years ago. Time and change have brought to today's investor in trust shares several concrete advantages. Investment managers have learned a thing or two. They couldn't very well help it. From their bath of folly, the trusts are emerging cleaner and wiser. This will be a powerful lesson to me, said the colored man who was about to be hanged. If any of the lessons were not explicit enough, we now have the SEC, tirelessly engaged in the inspiring work of seeing to it that investment trust officers have periodic nervous breakdowns. Suppose you believe that today some of your funds should be in common stocks, and you ask me the straight question, do you believe that a reputable investment trust will handle the selection and trading of my stocks better than I could myself? My answer is, yes, I rather think so, though that probably is faint praise. It is now generally agreed that when you are ill, it is better to call in a doctor to handle your case than to dose yourself out of a medical encyclopedia. This analogy between the science of medicine and the trading of securities is none too close, but that is the general idea. Proponents of the investment trust principle claim that they are working their way toward a professional footing. And high time, too, says a voice from the gallery. The Magical Investment Corporation for the record, I must make a correction to the statement that all investment trusts looked like monkeys at the time of the boom and crash. The statement was only 99 and 44 one-hundredths correct. Once upon a time there were two small trusts, managed by the late John W. Pope, which were of such stuff as dreams are made on. To be exact, the time was that impossible period in finance, 1929 to 1931. Everything about these companies was the opposite of all other trusts, including the fact that they made big money while the others were losing big money. Everything about the intellect and philosophy of the youthful Mr. Pope was the reverse of what I have explained a Wall Streeter must be. His statement of condition as of December 31, 1930, was extremely simple. All the money was in cash and call loans, which, strangely enough, was precisely where it should have been. The statement also contained an incredible sentiment. I quote from memory to this effect. It is the belief of the management of this corporation that a diversified list of carefully selected securities held over a period of time will not increase in value.
his record of performance was even more startling than his principles. Frequently his trusts had only a single large position, and that would be on the short side. Nearly all other investment trusts forbid themselves ever to take a short position. During these periods, of course, the profits showered down, month by month, and even day by day. John Pope came to his untimely death in 1931. He was still a very young man, a sort of Keats or Shelley of finance. It can now never be known whether his amazing record could have been sustained, whether indeed he would have continued to be, as he was then, the brilliant exception that proves the rule.